Um, if you just came in, feel free to say hi in the chat. Uh, maybe just drop your location and where you're streaming from, and we'll get started in a little less than a minute. Charles in California. Hey, Charles. I am also in California and Los Angeles, so good to see you. From California as well, okay. And from San Francisco, or Amy in California, okay. Chicago, hi, Linda. Robert, hey, show Robert, where is that? Texas, Reno, awesome. Welcome, welcome. So if you're just coming in, we're just saying hello, just to get a sense of where everyone is located. Um, so feel free to say hi in the chat and where you're streaming in from. Um, and it's already a couple minutes past the hour, so um, to respect and honor everyone's time here, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's really lovely to be with you all. My name is Dr. Matthew Goodman. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm also a consultant and founder of the Middle Way Consulting, uh, which is an agency that helps individuals and organizations have more effective conversations. And I also teach improv classes to individuals and organizations. So some of you may have been in my session just a half hour ago, um, focused on improv and how improv can help us not only with conversations, but being more present in life. But the focus of today is gonna to be on conversations and how to have more effective conversations, particularly when those conversations are difficult or high stakes or emotional. And I know that all of us by nature of being social human beings have been in situations where we've had to have difficult conversations, whether it's with someone at work or with a loved one or a friend or maybe a stranger that we've encountered. And I think the conundrum that a lot of us often come across is having to make a choice sometimes. Do I have this difficult conversation with someone and risk impairing or um, hurting the relationship in some way, or should I avoid having the conversation altogether? And what I want to present here, or at least the potential for today, is a third way of how to actually approach and have these conversations, but in a way that can actually strengthen and deepen our relationships with one another. So I draw a lot on my work as a clinical psychologist, having conversations with people and working with people around behavior change or people who are experience, experiencing resistance or difficulty or confusion around behavior change. And really, what are the skills that we can use to help to build more safety and trust in our relationships and then actually get somewhere, whether that's discovering some sort of solution together or a deeper truth together, or maybe you're in a position where you want to be more effective at uh, motivating other people or persuading other people. So we're going to cover all of that today. And I hope that you can walk away with maybe one or two skills that would be useful for you. And um, we'll go through a lot, and I know it's a lot of information for a short period of time, but hopefully there will be something that resonates with you, something that you can take away from our talk and then directly begin experimenting with in the conversations and the relationships that you have in your everyday life. Uh, so yes, hi everyone, Robert, Vishnu, Odell, welcome, welcome. If you're just joining us again, feel free to say hi in the chat and where you're coming in from. Um, so what I thought we could do for today is first, I wanna actually just give you some very tangible tips and skills and I'll share my screen in a moment and present a model of some things that we can put into place immediately to begin having more effective conversations. And then from there, we can also go through a live example together. If anyone wants to be courageous enough to share some example from their life of a challenging relationship or conversation that they've had or want to have with someone, and we can actually work, I'd be happy to workshop that with you together so we can get a live example of what that looks like together. But just to start off with, what are some examples from people of challenging conversations that you encounter in your own life? And feel free just to drop in the chat 
Um, what are some examples? You can give me people, you can give me contacts like at work or at home, but um, I'd love to hear um, some ex examples of maybe what people are dealing with now or have dealt with in the past. My family, of course. Um, family is often, <laughs> these are often the people who it's most difficult to have deep conversations with. You know, relationships, okay. Any conflict with my partner, I avoid. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Parents, workmen working around my house. Okay, yes, that is that is a wonderful example. Teenage children, managers who don't take action. Okay, family, boss, awesome. Culturally related conversations. Awesome. Awesome. So, okay. Yeah, great. Great. So these are all wonderful examples. And as we can see, these difficulties come up really in anywhere we are, and they can come up in any relationship. And I think we can all even get a sense here just through sharing just a little bit here that we're often caught in this position of like, well, do I just try to handle the situation on my own? Should I avoid the conversation altogether? Um, or what happens if I have it? Is that going to ruin the relationship? So again, what I hope to offer today is some really tangible things that we can use to feel more confident going into these relationships where we know that we can actually help to strengthen and deepen our relationship with that person on the other side of what's going on for us. Yeah, these are fantastic and feel free to keep them coming in, in the chat here. So what I'm gonna do just for uh, this first portion of today is just share my screen um, with you all and just give us a little bit of a framework or a model that we can begin to start using. So let me do that. Okay, hopefully you can see this picture here. Yeah, I'm just looking through the chat. Yeah, fantastic, great, great. So I wanna go through some of these steps um, with all of us today. And to do that, I think it would be helpful to actually use some sort of um, example here. So, um, Let's see, does anyone want to volunteer an example in the chat? And if not, I'll come up with one for us, but just a brief maybe description of what the situation is and what is difficult about the conversation. Yeah, Dale, thank you, yeah. Okay, so I think maybe what we'll do, what could be helpful is let's use an example that we're all familiar with here, and we're not going to get into the weeds with this. Um, but who here has tried to have a political conversation with someone that has gone south? Irvin, actually. Okay, Irvin says hello to share. Feel free to type in the in the chat, Irvin, if you have an example here. I'll just give us a minute. Yeah, managers at work. Okay, awesome. Family members. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, this is great. Let's take this first example here. Let's say you have a manager um, at work and you're wanting to approach them about a um, difficult situation that's happening. Maybe you've tried approaching them in the past and they haven't actually taken action on that situation and you're thinking, should I go to HR example? So. And, and apparently, Irvin, you're reading Molly's mind and uh, probably some other people um, on this uh, call today as well. Okay, great. So we have a manager that we want to approach. So you can see here in the model that there are some preconditions. And I don't, we're not going to spend a lot of time on any of these things, but let me just point out a couple things that can be helpful to keep in mind. So first, going into the conversation, we want to be sure about what our own intentions are. So it's really helpful for us just to spend a few minutes with ourselves or however long it takes to really clarify what our intentions are going into the conversation. And then with that person, before we even start that conversation, to really clarify and set a shared goal. 
So let's say we're approaching our manager about something. Let's say it's a conflict that we're having with another employee in the workplace. Um, we want to be really explicit about what the goal is in our conversation with that person. Um, so is the goal to help to resolve that conflict? Hey, you know, uh, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, I really was hoping to talk to you about this conflict and I'd really love to get your feedback or your advice. Would you be open to doing that together? So you're setting a goal there. Or maybe your goal is just to be heard. Um, I really just wanted to share the situation with you and let you know what's going on. Um, I'll leave it in your hands, but would it be okay if we spent five or 10 minutes talking about this together? So we just want to be really explicit. In other relationships, let's say I saw a, peop a couple people say like our personal relationships, um, our romantic relationships. Sometimes our goal may not to be to solve a problem or anything like that, but just to be heard. So maybe we state that as our goal. I'd really like to share something with you and I would love it if we could just, if you would just um, be able to spend a couple of minutes just trying to hear me out and then I can do the same for you. So really just stating what your goal is of the conversation. So we'll start with there. Um, if you're in the position where, you know, you're, someone else is approaching you, um, it's really important to start with this first step um, of, of listening. Uh, so whether you're the boss or whether someone else is coming to you, this is often really, really helpful. Key here is being able to, to really listen. Um, and especially during difficult conversations, let's say a coworker approaches you with something that is going on to really give them space to make sure that they can get the information out. And this is a hard skill to really be able to listen, but it's something that we can train with practice. Um, the second thing we wanna do is to be able to reflect back what we're hearing from somebody else. Um, and by doing that, we create a sense of trust and safety with the other person. So if someone's sharing something really difficult with me that they're going through, we can reflect that in a couple different ways. We can make a, very simple reflection just by restating what we're hearing from that person. Um, you can restate what you heard word for word, or you might make a reflection that's interpreting something on a deeper level. It sounds like to me that you're experiencing a lot of frustration or anger in the situation. Do I have that right? Um, it sounds to me like you've been doing your best to um, improve uh, the conditions, you know, in the workplace, or it sounds to me that you've done what you can to try to remedy the situation and has it worked, is that right? So we're reflecting back that we're understanding what that other person's experience is. And we can show some empathy too with that. That, that must be really hard for you. I can't imagine what it is it must be like to go through that situation. So this is the step of reflection here. And by reflecting, you're letting the other person know, I see you, I hear you, I'm here with you. And this is gonna help again to strengthen the sense of trust and safety within the relationship. So if you want anything to happen, if we wanna be persuasive or we want the other person to understand us better, we have to show them that we understand them first. So this is why I have that bridge there is because we can think about this as our first job in difficult conversations is to build a bridge into someone else's world, is to truly show up and listen and understand. And that might be, you know, the only takeaway from today is my job first is to build a bridge into someone else's world. Once we do that, it's a lot easier for someone else to build a bridge into our world for them to understand us. And then we can also be a lot more persuasive um, when someone, when there's that sense of trust and safety there. So the third step in the model here is then just to validate. So we've already shown empathy, we've already reflected. So we just wanna validate you know, where that person is coming from. Um, to give some sense of truth um, and acknowledgement of their experience. And if we can, to find some common ground and some agreement here um, between that person. And then lastly, to um, once we've completed these three steps here, then we have an opportunity to contribute ourselves. And sometimes it's often helpful to ask the question to prompt, would it be okay now if I shared my side of the story or if I share what my experience is like or what I see what's going on? And I think this model, I think a really good example just to put this all into context is thinking about how this comes into play when we're having, let's say, a, a conversation with someone about a really emotional topic, like a political conversation, which I know we've all um, have, we've all experienced before. And oftentimes coming up usually against a dead end when we're having a political conversation 
with someone else. We feel like we get nowhere um, or the other person doesn't understand us or um, you know, the other person just becomes even more defensive about their beliefs. So I think that's an extreme example of a difficult conversation, but really helps to illuminate why this model is helpful. Uh, because in, you know, through experience and what the research shows us as well is that we're probably not going to get anywhere by starting off just lecturing someone or trying to persuade them or change their beliefs or trying to fix them in any way. When we start with that, people become more defensive. However, on the other hand, when we start with building a bridge into their world, oh, okay, this is how you see it. Yeah, is this, do I have that correct? Wow, yeah, I can understand why you, th why you see this certain uh, issue this way, given your experience in life, given the way you grew up and what's happened to you and the people around you. So really taking the time to listen, reflect, validate them, we're building a bridge into their world. And then once that safety and trust is there, then people are more likely to maybe even ask, what do you think about this topic? What's your take? What's your opinion? What's your point of view on this political topic? They might be more willing to listen to you on that. So I think with everything, you know, as a whole, that is probably the maybe one takeaway that I want to convey today as uh, just as a, a general um, approach, you know, more so than some of these specific skills is to think about starting with these really, really simple ways of being able to understand the other person and show them that they, you understand and creating trust and safety. I've had so many conversations as a psychologist and I've learned this lesson through many, many, um, through much trial and error and a lot of, a lot of failure, um, so to speak, um, in these relationships where someone comes in and they, you know, maybe want to change and I'm starting off trying to convince that person why they should change or give them the steps or whatever it is. And what I've learned through all of this is that with, although that's very well intentioned where we want to try to convince someone else of something or let them see the our point of view or try to get them to change, that's very well intentioned, but it often just doesn't work. And again, the behavioral science literature supports this. What we really need to do with people is to spend the time being with that person, being present, not trying to convince them, not trying to get them to change, showing them whether we understand, creating trust, creating safety. And then I've had this experience over and over again. Once that happens, people will automatically then ask you for what you think. So in these conversations, whether it's in my work as a psychologist or with people in my own life, if we lay the groundwork and spend the time to really, really create the safe container, all of a sudden people will be like, okay, Matt, yeah, well, what's, what do you think about this? Or what's, what's your take on this? And then we're in a totally different position when that happens. Now they want to build, they want to come across the bridge into our world. And now we're in a position to try together collaborative, collaboratively to come up with some sort of, to realize some sort of deeper truth or to come up with a solution together. But that can only happen we create that trust and safety, and we can be the ones that can help to lead that and set the tone for that. Um, so let me pause there. I know that's a lot of information and there's a lot of stuff on the slide here, a lot of different steps, but let me just pause and see if anyone has any questions so far. See some things coming up in the moderation panel here. Um, So let me know if you have a question in the chat. And if you're in the moderation panel, then I can click you and bring you on to the screen. So great question. Yeah. So what if the other person says, thanks, I'm glad you understand. And the conversation is over. That's a great question. And I think oftentimes that's where we might actually just find ourselves is just with that. Um, sometimes that is where the conversation ends up is that we better understand that person um, and and then that's it. And then maybe when we talk with that person a day later, a week later, or a year later, some of that trust and safety and some of that relationship has been developed. And so we have the groundwork there for that relationship. But to your point, a nice thing to do, and this is coming back to the preconditions, is to set the goal. And if you sense that that is going to be the outcome of the conversation, that like the other person um, 
they're only interested in you understanding them, but they're not interested in, in understanding you, set that condition at the beginning of the conversation beforehand. Hey, I'm wondering if we can take some time to talk about X, to talk about this issue. And, you know, I'm happy, you know, to start by really listening and understanding to you. And then afterwards, would you be willing to listen and understand to me? And then you can get their consent. And now you have an agreement. You have a pact for what's going to happen. So this is the this is the idea about setting a goal or set, setting the container of the conversation so you know what the expectations are. We want to set what exactly it is that we're going to talk about so that we don't get off track. So be very, very clear and specific. This is what this conversation is aimed at. And then this is what I want to happen. You know, my goal in this conversation or our goal is to better understand each other or our goal is to come up with some sort of solution together, um, whatever it might be, but setting that at the beginning of the conversation, then we know what we're going into. And, uh, and so does the other person as well, so that we don't get off track. Yeah. I'm just going to read some of the other ones here. Um, yeah, Chris, great point. So interpersonal relationship, I've seen that it could feel draining if one person typically needs to be the initiator. Yeah. I think that's a, a really important point to bring up. And some people like you might find yourself being that person, right? And that is super draining. If you're always the one listening and showing up, um, that can be super, super draining. And uh, that might even be worth having a conversation about. So that's a little bit meta right there. But, you know, I mean, that, you know, leads to other skills and relationships around, you know, setting boundaries and taking care of yourself and all those other, other things that are important. So of course we don't want to do this to the extent where we're feeling drained or burned out, but hopefully the idea is that if we can set these conditions, then actually we get re reciprocated and then it can be rejuvenating because we get a chance to be heard by the other person um, as well, especially if we can agree on that in the beginning, but um, it's a great point to bring up. Um, overcoming uh, anxiety about speaking the truth. Yeah, yeah, totally, Robin. This is huge. And I know it's so hard to do that, to actually speak the truth, especially when you feel like that truth, uh, it's not safe to do so. Uh, you feel like the other person or the people in the room are not going to listen or they're going to judge you in some way. Um, that's a huge thing. And so uh, as with any anxiety, I mean, really, the 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 simple answer is just to to do it more. But I know that's not a, that's not a, a good answer. That's <laughs> um, not necessarily helpful. Um, so how can we do that in a way? How can we start to take those baby steps where we can then build confidence over time? Um, again, I think just at the outset, you can set some conditions and saying, um, you know, I would love to share my opinion here, and I know that this might not, everyone might not agree with this opinion or you might not agree with this, but it's really important for me just to share what I'm feeling. Um, would that be okay if I do that? Um, so you're just setting a little bit of context, making it a little bit safer to do that. Techniques to uh, listen actively to other person's needs without the need to respond immediately or at all. Yeah, Irving, I love this at all. I, I love this very much. Um, how do we listen actively? How do we really drop in? Because this is this is the first step and this is the first skill that can create that sense of safety and other people really feel it when we're listening. And you have probably experienced this where there's someone else on the other end of your conversation and can't you really just, can you feel when that other person is really present with you? And, and that feels really, really good. So how can we do that? That's a skill that we train with with practice. And I talked about this in the improv session a little bit, but we can actually practice working this muscle. And I would start in conversations that feel really safe and comfortable. So like with your spouse or a close friend in practice, dropping in, noticing when our mind is starting to think about what we want to say next or planning what we're going to say or where we think the conversation wants to go and coming back and really just dropping in. And it's easier said than done for sure. But with practice, just like any other muscle, we can train that mindfulness muscle to truly be present. And with that, we're actually opening up possibilities. So we're stepping into the unknown and we're going on a journey together. Because if we come into the conversation and we have some idea of what these are my thoughts and this is where it needs to go, then we're not present and we're not on a journey together with that person. So really this is, what we're talking about here is about stepping into the unknown with someone 
And when we're building bridges and trying to deepen relationships, oftentimes that requires us to maybe loosen a little bit whatever our ideas are, what we think the solution is or what's wrong, what the problem is, and to be open enough. And that's a process of co-discovery. So we practice the skill of mindfulness, being present and stepping into the unknown. Um, so yeah, these are these are awesome. Let's do a couple more because I know we only have a few minutes left here. Um, let's do a couple more, and then if anyone has any overarching questions, um, I can take that. And then I'll also just share my email address if anyone has questions or wants to follow up or start a conversation on anything else. Um, let's see here. Yeah, Jonathan, yeah. So that's a great point, Jonathan, bringing up what do you do when your level of empathy and patience and willingness is so much higher than the person on the other end? And this uh, relates to one of the questions that came up a little bit earlier as well about being drained, about feeling draining. And yeah, I, I, I totally hear that. That is really tough. And I mean, who here? I'm sure a lot of hands would go up for people that have experienced that before in our relationships, whether it's like a family member or maybe even our spouse, you feel like you're the one who's willing to show up and have that conversation. Um, and here, I'm just gonna switch hats from like talking about conversations maybe to therapists have a little bit, although obviously we're not doing therapy, but, um, and just to, you know, think about the importance of self-care and drawing boundaries. And sometimes, you know, there's only so far we can go with people. Um, this isn't a model or a way of trying to manipulate other people into being more kind or empathic, but it's an offering. It's an opportunity for people to, to show up and meet you there if they want to. And sometimes they don't want to, or they're not capable of doing that. And there has, you know, there's some sort sense of acceptance um, that has to come with that as well. So, um, and doesn't mean resignation or giving up on that person or having that conversation or that relationship or anything, um, but to really be self-compassionate and know that if we're truly being honest and we feel like we're doing everything that we can and we're coming to the table honestly and authentically um, and we feel like that need is not being met, yeah, sometimes it's it, it does feel very disappointing um, and there's only so far we, that we can go on our own without the other person collaborating with us. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. So John, great question. Bringing up like if someone has ADHD or has difficulty paying attention, um, which is really hard, right? Cause you can't get inside their brain and force them to pay attention to you or to focus better or anything like that. I would just say, I mean, put a little structure around it being like, Hey, can we talk about this for two minutes? Like, can I, like, would that be okay? Um, can we, so giving like a time limit sometimes can, can help people to, to focus or hyper focus. Um, and so, you know, setting a time and then saying, these are the things that I really want to talk about, being very clear on the point so it doesn't feel vague or messy, um, but to really help to focus their attention, prompt their attention in a very specific way. Yeah, awesome. Isabel, yeah, thank you. Um, so I know we're coming to the end here. Um, feel free if you have any last minute questions to type in the chat. I'm just going to share my email address. I'll put my website on here as well. Um, um, feel free to reach out anytime if you have questions about anything. Um, but I really appreciate everyone showing up uh, to this and uh, for your kind attention and listening. And I wish it could have been a little bit more uh, bi-directional, but hopefully maybe in uh, other uh, uh, presentations or maybe other conversations that we have, we can talk a little bit more in depth about that. Um, and wishing you all luck. Hopefully there's something that you can take away, even it's just the smallest thing that you can begin experimenting with and applying in your relationships. Um, and I'm wishing you best of luck in those relationships and those conversations. And thank you so much for being here.